Coming up in this week in computer hardware, AMD Vega 7, new Ryzen CPUs, RTX 2060. The Asus Pro Art Monitor is amazing, and one TV I can't stop talking about. It's part one of our CES 2019 coverage, coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 499, recorded on January 10th, 2019. AMD Radeon 7, new Ryzen CPUs, NVIDIA's RTX 2060, it's CES 2019. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. Are you a small business owner in need of capital today? On Deck can help. With over $10 billion in loans and an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, On Deck is a lender you can trust. Find out more at ondeck.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you those useful, most engaging, most informative, and occasionally most slurred introductions with the least used of consonants ever recorded at the Twitch production facility. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm in the media room somewhere between the Venetians and the Sands here in Las Vegas. And uh, freshly returned home, showered, and I suspect, if he's lucky and the baby didn't cry all night, relaxed. Sebastian Peake joins us from PC Per. Are you feeling good? about what you saw at CES this year, Sebastian. I am, and yes, I am well, I'm well rested, showered. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable right now, I'm warm. Uh, I have my home around me. It's, it, it, you know, Patrick, there's nothing, there's no place like home, truly. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I skipped out early and left you there, I apologize. It's okay, but I, I did get a special treat uh, and I waited uh, in, a, in a press event that lasted considerably longer than it was supposed to because I was so full of hope that it would show up. And uh, uh, we'll talk about AMD's announcements in a second. But I, I should ask you, there, there are two big GPU announcements this week. NVIDIA RTX 2060, AMD Vegas 7. One of these things is not like the other. Ha ha. Uh, and we, I think we kind of extensively discussed what we thought the 2060 was going to be this uh, last week. How are you? I mean, it's 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 we pretty much have the price, the performance. You guys have preliminary numbers up on PCPer.com. Uh, right. I, this is looking like the card that's officially going to beat the 10 series cards in the submission. Yeah, it's it's an interesting product because it's really not what I would have expected before I saw performance based on the mm -hmm. name. Like if we look at the previous generation, like. X60 cards, like the 1060 or the 960, right. 760. These were really your mainstream kind of a 1080p gaming cards. And uh, this is this is kind of a new category. Like looking at the core, just to look at specs just a little bit, uh, this is based on the same core as the 2070. Right. So it's, it's like a modified version of, of the TU-106. It has 1920... Uh, cores, and it operates at a little bit lower base clock than the 2070 out of the box. But of course, we haven't mm -hmm. we haven't tested like the the board partner versions of this yet. And it has six gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, so it still has quite a bit of memory bandwidth, even though it's been reduced from 448 down to 336 gigabytes a second. So it, it's a a more efficient card that still has quite a bit of power and so much power in fact that this almost feels like the ti like if there had been like a 2060 right. ti i know there wasn't a 1060 ti there was a 1066 gigabyte and a three gigabyte so we'll see if there are going to be further versions of this but the numbers really show this to be somewhere in between like 1070 and 1080 levels where depending on what you're doing you're sometimes neck and neck with a 1080 you're pretty much always above a 1070 so the, and and over last year's 1066 gigabyte, there's right. literally about a 2x improvement. So it's it's completely uh, kind of out of that mainstream performance level almost. But really, honestly, the price tag is a little out of the mainstream too. Like this is a $349 part, and that you know it's 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 a little bit out of some people's comfort zone it's a little bit out of where maybe somebody might right. be looking for that true mainstream like 200 to 250 dollar like 1080p card but we have yet to see what's coming from nvidia because i'm sure if they're following along the 
previous tradition. years, yeah, traditions. It, there'll be a ten, there'll be a twenty fifty, like a ten fifty replacement, maybe a ten fifty Ti replacement. So those will be really right. interesting, lower cost cards. But performance of this, and I have the, I have the card here, and we we had the founders edition card to test initially. Mm -hmm. um, further testing with other cards uh, to come, but very very impressive, very powerful performance and. Kind of feels right, like as far as performance and price. Maybe a little right. bit less performance for a lower price is coming, but three hundred forty-nine dollars for what this can do. And we saw some interesting demos at uh, Nvidia's suite at CES where they were showing like a gaming, like a streaming content creator setup where they were using a twenty sixty for their gaming, and then the twenty sixty is actually able to offload uh, video encoding from the CPU while gaming and sending out right. the stream at the same time. So there, it's absolutely like a kind of a workhorse 1080p product that's also aimed at like the 1440p enthusiast sector. Right. Not so much 4K. So if they, if they were to label these based on resolution, this would be like your ultimate 1080 or like your 1440p card. And then right. like the 2080, 2080 Ti are like your 4K cards. So I, I, I got to say, you know, I've been... Because I, I, I need a, a short 215 millimeter card for build I'm doing. And I'm like, you know, I'll get a 1060, I'll get a 1070. It's, it's you know, there's not much in the way of RTX uh, ray tracing gaming out there. It's going to be a while. I can wait. And I look at this card at this price. I mean, you know, I, I, outperforming a 1070 Ti, do you feel comfortable saying that? Or at least performing at parity with? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, yeah. it's right in the but, middle of the 1070 and 1080, so... Yeah, so that's, you know, and those cards are now selling for, you know, 1070 Ti's are selling for $500. And that's kind of why I said at the beginning of this, you know, this is the card that's kind of finally going to beat the 10 series cards into submission. And, you know, unless you happen to need a 215 millimeter card, don't feel like waiting for the short 2060s to come out. But this is a, when you look at the existing cards, like, you know, 10 series, 10, 10 series 1060s are all the way up around, you know, $300 right now. As, as supply, I think, finally tapers off. So if you've been thinking about a 1060, it is a no-brainer to get the 2060 instead. You're going to get a massive increase in performance for about, you know, for uh, in terms of 6 gigabyte cards, you know, maybe you're going to pay 100 bucks more. And it's I, I get, you know, also what you're saying earlier, because 350, well, for 1080p performance is a bargain, but if you're a 1080p gamer, 350 is like, you know, you were probably looking forward to getting a hundred eighty or two hundred dollar card, but right. I'm I'm kind of really curious to see how they fill out the rest of the lineup, and what they kind of do, or if they do an alternate to the RTX series, because it seems like once you get much lower than the 2060 in terms of performance, I think ray tracing is going to be pretty hard to do. They 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 did show some demos with ray tracing on the RTX 2060, but I think the interesting story there is going to be when we can implement DLSS. And just to briefly explain what that is, it's the deep learning uh, mm -hmm. super sampling for anti-aliasing. Uh, right. They compared it side by side with TAA, like the temporal anti-aliasing. And the the Port Royal demo just came out while we were there, of course. So coming back home, that's a new benchmark. It's it's like the industry standard 3D mark benchmark for ray tracing. But right. what is not yet enabled in that benchmark is the DLSS support, and that is coming. And they had a pre-release version to show side by side. And essentially what you're getting with DLSS is about the same visual quality, if not in in certain cases actually better. Like the way that they explained it and the way that it looked in person was it's able to intelligently identify like defining the edges of objects so it can maintain sharpness at the edge and the smoothing happens like throughout the image so right. it, it ends up being a little bit less soft looking than just taa does so but the big thing is the, the performance improvement so it was running at significantly higher frame rate with the lss and on the other side of the room i saw a demo running on a 2060 that looked absolutely playable so mm -hmm. when we get dlss support in games i know it's coming to shadow of the tomb raider and uh, I know Battlefield Five has been kind of the poster child of ray tracing so far. Mm -hmm. When we get that support in games, I think that will be an even bigger story <laughs> for the 2060 because it's it's a fully ray tracing capable card, and they're 
their messaging for the 2060 has really been that it's a 1440p gaming card. So if you're that enthusiast who wants like the ultra wide, like, you know, whatever by 1080 monitor, or if you have uh, like a 1440p gaming monitor, like a high refresh monitor, this is the card. And I imagine there will be a 1080 focused solution coming later. Uh, it makes sense to me. I mean, it's, I'm really, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to repeat what you just said. DLSS is <laughs> I mean, fascinating. It's, no, it, no, it no, but it's, 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 it's mysterious and fascinating. Like the little I yeah. read about it, it's like, I, I would love to like dive into this and find out exactly what it's doing, but it's, the results are definitely impressive as far as the fact that it's more efficient because it's using fewer samples and, and the frame rates are absolutely higher. So it's a, in, in, in case people are like, well, why don't you know more about this? It's because NVIDIA hasn't really shared much information. And when they got into the Turing architecture, this is how they explained DLSS. DLSS leverages a deep neural network to extract multi-dimensional features of the rendered scene and intelligently combine details from multiple frames to construct a high quality final image. Using fewer input hey. samples and traditional tech. You know what I mean? It's like, it was very like- yeah, I, I read that too. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah, a little yeah, you know I mean? ambiguous, it's, but- it's like ambiguous. their secret sauce. And Vegas yeah. is kind of loud. Yeah, but it's also that is a that is a total secret sauce moment because what they're saying is we're going to use fewer samples, we're going to do a better quality <laughs> rendering, we're going to you know enable lower power cars to do more extraordinary things, um, you know, and we're going to use AI to do it. And you know, back off, kid. We'll let you see it when it's done, and you can tell us how cool it is. Um, you know that that <laughs> reminds me of when I was. Uh, getting into talk about VR headsets that use eye tracking to enable like more intelligent foveation. Like when you have just right. just the area of focus is all you really need to have rendered at high resolution right. with high textures and the rest of it can kind of gently blur off into the background. DLSS almost sounds like the same kind of idea where it intelligently decides what needs to be done to make it look good. Mm -hmm instead of just everything has to be done the same at every frame, which is where it really kind of bogs right. down the system. It is kind of crazy to think about how sophisticated we are getting just to basically make it easier to zap aliens in space. Um, <laughs> and I don't mean to dismiss it because I think gaming is important and I think gaming is fun, but the level of sophisticated technology they're doing basically just so this chunk of the screen your eyeball is following uh it's yeah i i don't know it's kind of crazy to look at this and to see what's happening i also got to say it's kind of crazy to see some of the refresh rates that we're seeing on gaming monitors but we can talk more about that next week but yeah massive monitors huge 144 frames per second and higher uh, rendering rates but the rtx 2060 looks like a winner if you have a 1080p monitor, it sounds like you should probably wait to see what happens next, unless 350 is something you don't mind spending. Um, AMD Vegas 7. I I was expect I was all set to see desktop Ryzen uh, parts being released and some loose details on the next generation AMD Vega cards. But this is this is if their numbers are legit, this is a huge step up from first generation Vega. And also a big sort of thumb of the nose to have the planet who manufactures chips because they're running at seven nanometers. They're they're running a seven nanometer process for this. Yeah, I, I you know I was so ready for desktop that I was actually uh, sitting at the airport making charts for desktop <laughs> based on uh, early like leaks and that sort of thing because I, I wasn't I wasn't briefed on it. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll we'll talk more about that a little later because uh, I know a non tech had like the inside scoop on some of the desktop that's coming up but vega 7 or vega 2 uh, you know when we first saw the the trademark of the image that's where all the speculation started it's like is it 7 is it vega 2 vii and whatever you choose to call it it is absolutely the second generation vega part and right. one of the things that i found was you know, fascinating about this. It wasn't very long ago that we had news of the JDAC specification changing for high bandwidth memory too, and up to 24 gigabytes, uh, denser stacks, still at the same bandwidth. And here comes mm -hmm. this part with 16 gigabytes of the, the fast HBM2. 
with just crazy amounts of memory bandwidth available. And that's something that it, I believe it was Samsung that worked with, with them on the standard to get that kind of uh, capacity where we had previously not seen anything. I think eight gigabytes might have been the limit with the previous generation. But mm -hmm. it I and, and anybody who questions the price, uh, you know, at six ninety nine, it, it's a probably a very, very expensive proposition to put sixteen gigabytes of HPM two in a product at this point. Right. But uh still, I mean, relative to the market, if it's putting up seven hundred dollar ish gaming numbers then that price totally makes sense we have yet to see that february 7 is the launch uh it's like just the, the 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 specs we were shown are that it has 60 compute units which translates into 3840 stream processors and the core clock is 1.8 gigahertz i've already seen some discussion about well what if you put it on liquid because we saw some liquid versions of previous vega cards and absolutely I, I would hope that there's the band the uh headroom to go faster with uh exotic cooling but we'll see i would did love you, to see did, some early performance numbers did you see it was or feel like because they they were very heavy duty on comparing it to the previous generation vega they had a lot of of their own internally generated benchmarks for that did it feel odd to you that they didn't compare it specifically to any NVIDIA cards? Or does that seem like sort of a gracious, you know what our existing cards do in performance, you know how they compare to the existing NVIDIA parts, you know, figure out. They, they, they didn't seem to call out NVIDIA at all. And given how happy and cheerful they were uh, with the third gen Ryzen information to call out Intel specifically, did it seem a little odd that they were just kind of, we have a much faster card, it's awesome, look at our seven nanometer, it's so much faster than our first generation card. And never really kind of got anywhere near doing side-by-side -side or discussion of NVIDIA. Well, there was definitely, it seemed a, almost as much focus on content creation as there was on gaming. And yeah. we, we know where their confidence is. We know that AMD is supremely confident in their processors at this point because I I don't know if I'm ready yet to say that it's, it's kind of like the... Athlon XP, Athlon 64 era, where they had mm -hmm. such an advantage with like price performance and just fantastic right. lower cost parts for for mainstream consumers and gamers. But now, they, and of course, they also have Threadripper, which is just a fantastic. The the more cores, the better. I mean, I right. And this product, I'm not sure. I mean, on on one side, anyone who is in the like. Mac ecosystem, like OpenCL, uh, anyone who uses Radeon cards specifically for their compute, this is a more powerful mm -hmm. solution. But for gamers, I think it will come down to not just preference, like brand loyalty, but performance. Right. And for them to compare it against previous generation parts makes sense for them. Like you said, maybe if they're not Maybe if they're not as confident about showcasing their card versus the competition at this point, which anytime you don't directly call them out, like you said, they're they're more than willing to call out Intel. Right. And so I, I will wait and see. I'm not going to make any hasty judgments here. Right. But yeah, it, it kind of seems like they might be waiting. But I, it sounded like they had final uh, clock speeds. Unlike yeah. desktop. So if, if this is it, if this is 1.8 gigahertz, its final product, they, they know internally what it can do. It was the, I mean, the closest thing is, you know, like, you know, one of the benchmarks is they're like 25% faster uh, than Vega one on Fortnite. And I remember seeing like, you know, they did a Capcom uh, DMC5 demo. And then it was like, you know, versus RTX 2080, similar performance. And uh, that was pretty much the closest they came to get really in depth because I'm, I'm scrolling yeah. through my AMD keynote notes. Um, extremely excited about, uh, you know, once they, they stopped pushing content creation, they did a huge segment. They were talking about, you know, esports and the number of viewers and how it's growing. And, you know, Sam Matthews from Fnatic came on. Um, but uh, it was, you know, they literally, I should say, uh, you know, they, AMD literally did a, a Steve Jobs kind of moment, a, a one more thing moment. And, 
he, they brought out the and the crowd got really enthusiastic. So I was sitting in the back of the room videotaping, and it's like you know, third gen AMD Ryzen desktop processors running seven nanometer. Um, you know, they showed it. They're like, this is early silicon. Uh, they were, I guess, they're running fours at 100 plus frames per second. Um, you know, third gen Ryzen against Core i9 9900K with Cinebench, uh, and uh, you know, they don't have final frequency. It's an early sample. Um, but part of what was really interesting is, A, the architecture of the chip, which uh, I'll, I'll leave to Sebastian so I don't mess it up. But looking at the, if these are legit, um, they're, you know, it, it, at, when they were looking at the, the rendering for uh, video files in Cinebench, uh, the Intel part was consuming like 180 watts and the AMD part was consuming 133 watts. And they were discussing how moving to the seven nanometer process had given them some really significant heat and performance advantages. Um, and it was interesting to think of AMD as being the, the processor consuming less power, because I always think of AMD as being the processor that they, they, they start hot and they get hotter, and then they're ridiculously hot, and that's just part of owning an AMD part. And, you know, I've, I've got an 1800X, uh, you know, you'll pry from my cold, dead fingers because I love rendering video on it so much. But it was very interesting because that was a, you know, they challenged the Core i9-9900K on content creation. Uh, they called out their power consumption. They very specifically, you know, stuck a thumb in Intel's eye over being on a seven nanometer process. Um, that, the triplet die is kind of fascinating, right? The biggest, yeah. thing, you look at the chip, the close up on that, uh, Dr. Sue held up, um, you know, that the, the bigger die, the bigger, the, the bigger black blotch in the middle of the CPU uh, is that's the IO. And, and that's handling passing bits between the Zen 2 engine and the rest of the system. Um, you know, and they also called out that they were supporting PCI Express 4, which right. feels early, or are we looking at a whole nother generation of, uh, are we looking at a whole nother generation of graphics cards based around PCI 4 in a year or two? Well, I mean, video obviously, but also storage, because you know I think it was Faison who was showing storage that could hit four, four gigabytes a second. Whoa. And we're already at the limit, pretty much, of what PCI Gen 3 by 4 can do. Right. So that's an interesting aspect of it. But, yeah, I mean, they were saying first to market with fourth generation PCI Express. Uh, the the interesting thing, and I know Anon Tech had a pretty detailed uh, exploration of this. They got their hands on a sample. And when they were briefed on it, they were taking pictures and they did these like digital measurements where they're looking at die size versus like chiplet right. size. And they, they think that it's very possible this is this sort of modular design could enable them to put additional CPU cores on this AM4 uh, processor. So, I, I mean, initial rumors, some of the reports we saw ab were, were claiming that they were absolutely going to be doing 16 core AM4 desktop, right. which seems kind of crazy. I mean, we were talking about that last week, but this design, I mean, there's a lot of empty space there to do something with. So <laughs> I would, I'm very, very curious to see if perhaps, you know, just move that one chiplet up and just put another one down below it. And I don't know if, right. if, uh, if thermal dissipation is a concern at all or, or what, but at seven nanometer, definitely they seem to have that advantage, like you said on stage, where they were showing, you know, roughly identical results mm -hmm. with Intel and significantly lower power. So, a combination of the move to a, a smaller process node and refinement of the architecture seems to have won them some definite performance gains that are. It's really exciting. I mean, as exciting as Ryzen was and then Threadripper was, and we had second gen Ryzen, the concept of third gen Ryzen that is at least eight cores, 16 threads, and potentially right. hitting some pretty aggressive clocks at lower power, I mean, it just keeps on getting better. So for the consumer, uh, competition is, is very fierce, and that's great because it's driving costs down. And it's good for we've us. Gone from, yeah, <laughs> we've gone from, what, what would you have thought you'd spend in like 2016 on eight cores, 16 threads at like four gigahertz? I mean, wow. it was... It was it, I, I would have expected to, you know, spend like, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. And, you know, like I said, when the 1800X came out, 
I, you know, I bought one out of pocket to benchmark, and there was this extraordinary performance. I would say, I, I feel I feel like I remember I paid almost $500 for it. A year later, it was before the, the, the next-gen Ryzen uh, uh, 7 parts were out. You know, the price had dropped down to $350 for a level of performance that was almost 50% faster than the top of the line uh, Intel part I'd been running that was, you know, I guess a year, maybe not even a year and a half old at that point. Um, AMD's, I, it's funny, we haven't talked too much about Intel, but it was really interesting to sit in the Intel keynote and have them talk about processors upfront and early and enthusiast processors, or at least, you know, mainstream processors and, and their high performance processors, you know, at the top and sounding like they act, well, you know, we actually, we're Intel, we actually do care about desktops and enthusiast markets and, and you're not an afterthought anymore. And oh my goodness, uh, you know, we're going to do like a, a hexacore part as a core i5 part instead of making you spend, you know, a significant more amount of money to get that kind. It's, you know, AMD is absolutely forcing Intel to, uh, you know, catch up and to drop prices and to pay attention and to be competitive. And I think this is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like history repeating itself, but it's it's that that era was when I got started as a PC mm -hmm. enthusiast, and to see this again, where Intel has gone from having such a an incredible lead, where it almost seemed in the bulldozer era, like AMD might never catch up. Yeah, to or the point AMD where might now, flat out disappear. Right. Yeah, that was another concern. And, you know, even among people in the community who really care about AMD, we're rooting for AMD, like they were concerned. And mm -hmm. then to see this where they have they have come back into such a position where they are forcing Intel's hand, forcing prices down and, and forcing core counts up, like you said, core i5 at six cores. And looking at mm -hmm. parts, like even at the entry level, I know the one new core i5 part they announced was, I believe, the 9400. Uh, right series and that's hex core and the typically i mean i haven't seen pricing yet but like the 8400 series 7400 those are like your 189 dollar 200 dollar parts in a mm -hmm. box with a cooler so that's that's pretty inexpensive for hex core and then of course right now on the market amd is selling their hex core parts their 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 ryzen gen 2 2000 series like 165 dollars for the 2600 so they're they've definitely upped the the competition to the degree that they are kind of a a driving force in not only uh, Intel's adoption of these higher core counts, but in forcing their prices down, which is fantastic. Yeah. Although prices I, prices are still it, it, AMD seems to still have the lead in pricing, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, and and that'll also force Intel if the if the sales aren't what Intel expects, maybe they'll actually force them to to think about their traditional margins and whether or not those are viable in this particular market. Or they'll be like, yeah, you know, there's still a, a, a moat, a tiny percentage of our over our over our overall processor sales, um, and that would be a reasonable response. It's like, ah, oh, they have ten percent of the market. Ah, oh, they have thirteen percent of the market. Most people, right, still buy laptops. The majority of consumers buy laptops these days. The majority of businesses buy laptops these days. And that was really interesting to me was that Sunday morning before CES really opened, uh, AMD dropped a whole family of mobile CPUs. Uh, you know, the kind of top of the line AMD Ryzen 7 3758s, it's a 35 watt performance part, the 3700U, it's a 15 watt four core eight thread. Uh, those are actually both 15, uh, 50, excuse me, both four core eight thread CPUs, 2.3 uh, gigahertz base, four gigahertz and turbo, uh, packing uh, Vega 10 graphics, i.e. 10 Vega compute units. Um, the Ryzen 5 is the 30, the Ryzen, basically the H parts are 35 watts, the U parts are 15 watts, and I'll stop talking about wattages. Um, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, again, wattages matter for, for notebook. Absolutely, but there's only so many times people can hear me say 35 watt and 15 watt back to back before they start throwing things at their computer or their phone. But um, you know, again, four core, eight core, uh, you know, four core, eight thread parts uh, at the Ryzen five level, but with eight GPU core parts uh, and running at you know 3.7 gigahertz max. Uh, Ryzen three, I thought this was fascinating. They have two parts, and one of them is a four core, four thread part. Uh, with either six or three GPU cores, 
running it at max at 3.5 gigahertz in, in turbo mode. And I was, I was really impressed. That's aggressive. And if these yeah. parts are as power efficient as I think uh, Ryzen mobile parts can be, this is going to be interesting to watch uh, Intel deal with because the idea of having you know a a, a Core i3 a Ryzen 3 part that is uh, offering that many cores is going to offer a pretty noticeable performance advantage I think in general computing especially at the price points parts like that usually tend to show up on. Yeah, we're used to seeing premium laptops on the Intel side that are quad core or dual core mm -hmm. hyper threaded parts. So to see you know, eight threaded parts at right. what I can only imagine will be a competitive price to the laptop manufacturers to implement is interesting. I know one of the things that I saw at the show at Asus was a all AMD gaming laptop series where they have the processor, they have discrete graphics from their RX series. But I think like you were saying, even for productivity, uh, you're taking a, like a mobile workstation or just general productivity device with you. Right. As long as it's power gating uh, aggressively and you have a really good longevity, uh, a 35 watt part is considered kind of like your high end typically even now, but 15 watts, especially those, the 3500U, the 3300U, we could see those in some smaller form factors perhaps mm -hmm. and sort of a similar thing to what you can currently find on the market with those ubiquitous Core i5 uh, thin and light laptops. So definitely interesting, and especially because you have the integration of the Vega graphics cores. So, you know, yeah. the, the laptop I took to CES, it's it's like the generic laptop of today where it's some sort of Core <laughs> i5 processor. This one's Coffee Lake. It's got like the MX series GPU from NVIDIA in it. And it's it's marketed as a productivity device, it's like a thin and light business laptop, essentially. Right. But th this opens up some interesting possibilities for sure. One of the claims AMD made uh, when they announced the mobile parts uh, was that those onboard Vega graphics were going to give you a pretty significant bump in frame rates on video games compared to say a Core i7 8565U, and never having run uh, Fortnite or Rocket League on that part. I now want to fire up a Rocket League or Fortnite on a Core i7 uh, and just so I can see what the real really? frame rates on that. But, well, there, okay, well, let me qualify that. They were talking about you 60 say, frames you say per what? second. No, I mean, yeah, in the interest on, of science. Feet. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. So with, with modest detail settings yeah. at lower resolutions. Okay. I mean, I don't want you to, to do that to yourself, but no, no. at the same time, it's, it's a valuable information. It's a good data point to have. No, it's and it, but it was funny because I, I just I have not bothered to you know except for sort of you know uh, whatever the PC equivalent of Lumity Town you know what I mean like I play phone level simple phone level games on my laptops most of the time because I don't have a discrete GPU in my laptop um, but the idea of of being able to play like Rocket League at 60 frames per second that's that's kind of compelling but it also makes me want to know exactly what the frame rates that are coming out of the the intel parts if they're comparing them to um and, and you know yeah let me be clear we're not talking about 1080p we're not talking about probably even medium uh detail you're talking probably fairly low resolution fairly low settings you know you are going to want a discrete chipset of some type uh if you are going to do mobile gaming which by the way sure. they announced yeah. the mobile NVIDIA announced the mobile versions of, I want to say, the 28, the 27, and the 2060. So it's a, I think we figured out there were, I think they said there were 40 uh, NVIDIA, yes. yeah, mobile NVIDIA uh, RTX powered gaming laptops that were announced just at this show. So it's uh, not a bad time to be buying a gaming laptop. No. And so, then one more quick point on Ryzen Mobile I was just thinking mm -hmm. about. Don't forget the whole mini PC space. Well, yeah, that too. But uh, I've right. been looking at mini PCs for years. And one of the arguments mm -hmm. was always like, oh, I, mean, I wish we could put an APU in this. I wish there was an APU from, from the commenters, right. from the readers. And this is a great uh, opportunity for that too, because you get one of these lower powered parts that can fit in one of those really small form factors or even a fanless solution. And you have significantly more graphics horsepower than you would in any of the right. current Intel integrated solutions. So... That's an interesting possibility as well. 
and a delightful one. Uh, I have to I have to call this out before I talk about this particular laptop. Um, uh, Tech Things coverage of CES 2019 was sponsored by Dell. However, uh, over the years, Ryan and I have discussed, I think, in detail, uh, and I've certainly uh, made first humorous and then really obnoxious comments over the years about the one great flaw of the Dell XPS 13, which is the nostril cam. And if you don't remember me talking about the nostril cam, it's oh, the fact that I they remember, were yes. so obsessed with the infinity bezels, the incredibly thin bezels, which I got to say look fantastic. And we'll talk about some Lenovo laptops that are moving in that direction next week. But they would always have the webcam down here. So it was always looking up here. And you, you would sort of end up with this, you know, kind of angle on things, which is not only unattractive, but makes it difficult to communicate. Or you stared uh, at the, dark, the the down corner of your your laptop. It, it's it's irritating. Um, I'll just leave it you at know, that. You know, Dell really and missed the boat there because they could have been the first to market with a notch. Think about it. It could have been the Dell XPS 13 with a notch right in the middle they, of the screen I, at the top. I was actually laughing because... Uh, my co-host on Tech Things, Shannon, tweeted out, Patrick is going to be so excited. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, I and saw I that. And I was just like, <gasps> <gasps> you know, and I, I I, literally went in and fondled the laptop in question over uh, oh, in, the, in the Dell okay. uh, the Dell, uh, the Dell display over here. And I got some, it was really interesting because they, they showed the old webcam module and the new webcam module. And you're, you're talking about the new one is like 2.25 millimeters down from 7 millimeters. So they made a huge reduction in the size of the part and then they also there across the top they made a slightly larger bezel so they did something uh we in the the married and parenting uh industries like to call compromises or a compromise uh and they left enough room at the top of the laptop to uh actually put a webcam a very tiny webcam and probably not uh, the best in terms of low light performance, but the reality is, is most people don't do business conferencing or Skyping home to their children in the dark. They usually do it in fairly, uh, fairly bright environments. And it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a Dell XPS 13. It types well, it looks good. Um, you know, they're going to be doing with this next one, the 9380. It's uh, eighth gen Core i3, Core i5, or Core i7 parts. Four gigabytes to 16 gigabytes. Uh, the entry price is 899, which I need to double check, but I believe that's a four gigabyte laptop. Don't buy a four gigabyte laptop. You'll be frustrated if you do. Um, you know, so they've got <laughs> 1920 by 1080, uh, 1920 by 1080 uh, touchscreen, or a 3840 by 2160 pixel touchscreen, which is that is the the predecessor to this. I've I have spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours uh, on that laptop. And it's well made. Uh, 128 gigabytes to two terabyte storage options, and those are basically they started shipping two days ago. And uh, let me just double check uh, to see what the lowest end configuration of the 9380 is. 899, four gigabytes, 128 gigabyte of uh, M.2 NVMe, but 128 gigabytes. If you can scrape up the money to step up to eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, Please do so. <laughs> As a public service message from Patrick Norton. Sorry, I just I, I had a cousin that bought a laptop and it was cheap and he found out why. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would say that twelve hundred dollar configuration with eight gigs and two hundred fifty six gigabytes of M.2 drive would be a really good start on that. And you know they're nice laptops. And again, in case you didn't hear me say it before, my coverage of Dell's. Dell sponsored our coverage at Tech Thing of CES 2019, but this is also a laptop I've been carrying and abusing uh, and testing forever, and I'm just really delighted that I, you know, I, I, they they will no longer be forcing the pain of nostril cam on their users. Not that that's yep. really bothered the snot out of me for a few years. <laughs> you know, I don't think that viewers really can appreciate if they're watching how, like, you you tried to recreate it. It's almost impossible to recreate without lowering your mm -hmm. webcam down to the keyboard level and pointing right. it up at the bottom of your face. It's so it's it, a, it was pretty extreme. It's a distinctly unpleasant view of almost every human being I've ever seen on it. Um, speaking of unpleasant and irritating, uh, I was also laughing on Twitter about this. <laughs> it's a tradition. Um, when 4G started rolling out, uh, my antiquated uh, iPhone at the time, which was a four or a six, I guess a four, um, magically 
received an upgrade. And in the top corner, and if you, I don't know if you've got the, the Verge article on this, uh, Jacob Kostanaki is with this one up. Uh, if you, I don't know if we can zoom in on that uh, at the mothership in Petaluma, but that there it is. You, Kevin, you're so wonderful. It says 5G. E. And I had a 3G phone that was always going to be a 3G phone because it only had 3G radios in it. And magically one day it became a 4G phone. Well, it didn't. Yeah. It just changed the, you know, display. So it would display 4G, uh, which I still to this day don't understand because wouldn't you want your customers to go buy a new phone that you would finance for two years and make all sorts of money off of? Uh, but this is, you know, this is just dumb. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember back in the area that you're talking about when AT and T had the enhanced backhaul HSPA plus. And I, I don't know. Was that a permanent thing? Was the 4G icon a permanent thing? Because I could, I guess I was on other devices when I was playing around with that, and I was getting the HS like the the plus logo when I was connected to a 3G network, even if it it's wasn't LTE. Like, you know, it's it's kind of like being called a particularly obscene name by someone. Uh, you know, unless it's really part of your relationship, you always remember that and are irritated about it. And as soon as I saw this, all of the irritation. Um, you know, of seeing that logo show up. I'm like, oh, it's 5G evolution. Um, but, uh, you know, true to my commitment <sighs> to, to bring up projectors every single week, uh, this is like <laughs> this is like the 4K projector thing where it's like 4K enhanced. Right. And it's it's really not 4K, but it's enhanced so it can like simulate 4K. This is like simulating... Right. Some of the advantages of being on a next-gen network without actually being on the next-gen network. Right. I will say the the Epson 4010, which does pixel shifting or faux FAUXK, uh, looks absolutely stunning and gorgeous, uh, even if it doesn't have true 4K uh, 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 projection. But it's it's uh, it's so odd, you know. It's a uh, there. It's it's it's. I just I don't know why why AT and T does this. You know, um, they're basically branding parts of their existing 4G LTE network as 5G evolution. Um, you know, in theory they're well, going to be faster than LTE, except it's all the same crap that you know. All this is set really more by the tower than the phones, and all right, the carriers yeah. have done this. It's not 5G, although 5G is a hot mess. Uh, for a thousand interesting reasons, uh, some of which I can't actually discuss on camera. Uh, well, I think, well, one of the things about 5G is like with right. the validation of the standard as to what it actually is, there were so many different ideas about what 5G could be at right. one point, whether it was like blanketing Wi-Fi throughout a, an environment or uh, combinations of different technologies working together like microcell. And if if they are providing... And I haven't read the technical details of what exactly AT and T is doing if they're sharing that. But if they are doing some sort of aggregation where you're you're legitimately getting more bandwidth than you would on the traditional 4G network, then like the traditional LTE network, right? Then that could be interesting. I know there there could be some technical advantages, but essentially this. I mean, let's face it. This is marketing. And while people like you and I and technically literate people will instantly point to this and question it and even laugh at it the average consumer who goes into one of the operator stores like AT&T stores looking for a new phone they're seeing advertising that says oh yeah this phone will do 5G and they're looking at basically a branding for areas where AT&T may not support 5G but now they can claim that they do so this is I, right. I, I wonder if they'll face any kind of sanctions about this as far as their national advertising goes because Seems a little questionable to say that you're selling a 5G product when you don't actually have 5G towers to back it up <laughs> in, in the areas where you're selling it. So that's I'd be I'd be very cautious about this if I were them. Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, I don't know. It's just it's it's unnecessary and it's irritating and it's it really has become kind of sort of a perverse tradition for this to happen. Um, it's like my tradition of leaving my cell phone in a cab at I think it's 
the the sands. Like I mean, we all have traditions <laughs> that are not good traditions, but you know, we life moves on. It does. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. On Deck is 100% committed to small business owners with fast, easy, and tailored financing. Your time is valuable. You don't want to be sitting in a room locked up, driving to strange locations to get money for your business. On Deck, they know your time is valuable. They get you funding in as fast as 24 hours with term loans up to a half million dollars, lines of credit up to $100,000, none of which require business collateral. The application process, simple. You can apply online with the phone, you can approve the minutes. It's not something where you're gonna be driving somewhere and meeting with somebody and filling out paperwork and just suffering. Best of all, it won't impact your personal credit because it's a business loan, not a personal loan. On Deck delivers some of the best customer service with their US-based loan specialist and has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. It's nice to see an A-plus rating and I don't think I get to see those very often. So, you know, this is trustworthy. They've lent over $10 billion to over 80,000 small business owners. On Deck is the secure financing service that business owners everywhere can truly rely on. If you're a small business owner and need access to capital, go to ondeck.com slash twitch right now. And as a listener of This Week in Computer Hardware, you'll receive a free consultation with one of their US-based loan specialists. Apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes. Go to ondeck.com slash twitch. That's O-N-D-E-C-K dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for your free consultation now. And we want to thank On Deck for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Oh, my goodness. Asus's ProArt PA32 UCX monitor, 1,200 nits and a 1,000 zone backlight. You know, that's I, staggering. <laughs> yeah, I, I started on one side of asus and they were i don't know if you visited them but they were in multiple suites by the time i got to their like professional and like uh content creator suites where i saw this monitor i was blown away by 512 zones in one of the gaming right. monitors and then i saw this and i i just stood there kind of with my mouth open for a while just watching this beautiful 4k footage they had of like scenery and like trees right. and beaches and things and it's there is a depth to there's a kind of magic to to really really good full array local dimming when it has this many zones mm -hmm. that it's 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 different from OLED and I have an OLED television right but it's it's a different kind of a thing like it's and this has the capability of far exceeding the HDR 1000 spec in mold, I mean, it had in the color depth and as well as the backlight, and the 1200 nit peak brightness is pretty staggering, especially on this 32 inch display. Yeah. But you know, companies using these very small LED individual LED lights directly behind the screen, which actually reminded me a lot of the like LG Infinia stuff mm -hmm. from way back in like 2009, 2010. And that was right. what I, I was I was lamenting the death of the full array local dimming system when edge lighting kind of took over and it was like the race to who, who could have the thinnest television. And it was basically considered too expensive because consumers didn't really understand what the benefit was. And the TVs were a little bit thicker when you have a direct backlighting system. So, right. But. HDR has brought it back. I have HDR to thank for restoring my absolute favorite display technology. And I've seen displays that look pretty good that were limited to maybe a dozen zones where you can at right. least um, control like corner lighting and things and, and dim sections of the screen. But this right. was, it, it feels almost like it's pinpoint control over the light when you have that many zones. And a thousand zones on a 32 inch screen is huge. I've, no, I've it's, it's let me let me put this into context for a second. You know, I think it was Vizio had a new a couple years ago. Robert and I thought that um, you know, basically you can light a monitor from the edge, or you can put you know LEDs behind it, and to have the more zones you have, the more granular the control you have, right? And that's what's part of what's different and what the yeah. advantage of an OLED is because you can control individual pixels. So. We were, I was to say, there's a the new Vizio, I want to say, is a 65-inch television with 480 zones. And I was absolutely blown away 
with the idea of a television that big with 480 zones. So we're talking more than twice as many zones in a television or excuse me, a monitor that's about a quarter of the size of that. So this is an astonishing amount of light control for a screen this size. Um, I mean, moving in this direction, Hisense had an interesting, uh, Robert was talking about this, we were talking about some of the, the, the best televisions that came out at CES this year. And Robert was talking about an experiment at Hisense. That there were, apparently there were actually engineers from other television companies openly coming up with measuring instruments to test and take pictures and just, and the high sense people were apparently just sitting there kind of beaming and, and <laughs> what they did was they took a 1080p panel and laminated it to a, a 4K panel, a 4K HDR panel, and used the 1080p uh, LCD as the backlighting. So there was one LCD pixel from the 1080p panel to light up each of the, or four pixels of each of uh, the 4K panel in front of it, and it's kind of a uh, a wild concept. But it's again, it's it's not OLED, it's not individual pixel control, but it's you know two million seventy three thousand six hundred uh, discrete zones for a 4K monitor, um, it, which is ridiculous and amazing. And I don't know if it's ever going to ship, but to have that level of one, that amount of brightness, which is pretty staggering. Um, and two, you know, I mean, that's, 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 uh, did they have like a basic HDR 1000 uh, rating or were they just kind of, you know, it's just, it's a, it's brighter than anything we've seen in this size. That level of backlighting gives an extraordinary control over how the monitor looks. I mean, I, I want to go find it now because I'm fascinated. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, it does have the Vesa 1000. They said they exceeded the spec. The the spec okay. I think was actually shown, like the the logo. But yeah, I mean, you do have to see it because it. You can only sort of try to think about what that many zones would look like on that small of a screen. But like you're saying, I mean, the more pinpoint light control you have, and it's it's reminds me of what Sony did with their Z9 TV. I think that was a couple of years ago now when that was introduced. Right where you just have an insane amount of light. Basically, they have a low-resolution display made of just white light behind the LCD. And right. the two are creating the same image at the same time, and the lower-resolution image is providing the luminance. And essentially, at that point, the LCD is just doing chroma mm -hmm. because it is just filtering light. And the result is just staggering. Right. And it's... I. I Hesitate to, uh, I mean, I don't know the retail pricing, and I'm sure it's probably going to be up there because it's a professional monitor. Let's face it, it's a pro sure. art monitor, and it's it just the amount of money that probably went into R and D. Right. It, it would not be unusual for a monitor like this to be four to six thousand dollars, especially depending on the level of, of sophistication and the calibration. Um, yes, exactly. And for them to so, be targeting, uh, like photographers and videographers mm -hmm. then I, I don't I don't think that it's a price that especially if you're creating HD content like HDR content I should mm -hmm. say like this this is you know close to that professional display where it can do right 1000 plus brightness and you have that kind of color accuracy and uh, black level control so it's pretty interesting to look at um, Man, I, I, you know, micro LEDs, uh, you know, they're showing up all over CS this year behind back panels uh, in products uh, from places like Corsair and other places. It's a very tiny, you know, it looks like a, a tiny, it looks like somebody, imagine sort of staring at a screen door really closely or the pixels on your screen and, you know, having several hundred LEDs packed into a square inch and you kind of get the idea of what's going on here. It gives them a lot of brightness, very different package a lot of granular control. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see where this technology shows up uh, and uh, and how it uh, how it influences things moving forward. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Sandisk Extreme Pro Portable. Uh, Sandisk came out with the uh, Extreme, which is a small portable drive, which looks a lot like this, but is a little bit smaller in all plastic. There's a aluminum frame. You can kind of see the sort of the red bits poking out of there, and, and Sam just wants to point out that they don't want you to put this on your backpack with a carabiner. Um, they have that uh, that little loop there. You can scroll down and show it on there. They want it inside your backpack. It's IP55 rated, so it's it's fairly splash proof. It's fairly dust 
proof. You know, they tested to six foot drops. Um, but that that loop on there is for a dummy cord to keep it attached inside your backpack. But they've they've taken the original one. They put aluminum in there uh, to make it more rigid, but mostly to dissipate heat because it's now an NVMe drive instead yeah. of a, a regular SSD. And the performance numbers they were talking about is they're flat out saying reads at a gigabyte a second. I'm kind of curious to get my grubby little paws on one and see what the write speeds are. But uh, available uh, in two terabyte, one terabyte, and 500 gigabyte versions. And those will be selling soon. And uh, yeah. if you know- These if, are ready to go. Yeah. I, yeah. I, got, I got my hands on them at, at Western Digital and mm -hmm. they, they're really focused on on trying to really saturate like the PCI 3.1 yes uh, bus as uh, the current generation bus as far as they'll go like like you said gigabit per second mm -hmm. or a gigabyte per second I should say so uh, I I am excited about faster storage that's for sure yeah I also I didn't know that the My Passport Go existed and. Uh, which is their less expensive consumer oriented uh, SSD, which is basically smaller than a passport drive, has a USB cable built into it so it's easier to store. Uh, it's, you know, it's not as, as uh, you know, you're not gonna wanna splash it in the water or play with it at the beach. Uh, but I was, uh, I was kind of excited to realize that there were portable SSDs at those price points um, from Western Digital. Or the My Passport Go, I wanna say it starts at like $89 for a 500 gigabyte version. There it is. It looks, it, yeah. it, you don't realize how tiny it is until you actually have it in your hand. Um, yeah, it's $89.99 for the uh, 500 gigabyte version. The one terabyte version is $170, which is kind of puts it on parity with the original Extreme Drive from SanDisk. And I, I, as I save up my pennies, I'm going to be replacing uh, as many of the rotating media portable drives in my life uh, with solid state drives just to have that much less to worry about as I'm bouncing my backpack uh, through the strange and terrible locales here at uh, CES. It's kind of like somewhere in between <laughs> thumb drives and hard drives, we now have these, like they're half the size of a portable SSD, they're bigger right. than a thumb drive, but they have tons of storage capacity. And you know the other advantage of, I was just thinking of, uh, they're harder, harder to, lose. to lose. Yeah, I, I'm a little <laughs> scared of buying really high capacity thumb drives with at the alarming rate that I tend to lose them. And uh, they'll randomly show up months later sometimes, but that doesn't really help me in the short term. So why is this in the cat's bed? Well, were you excited? Because the other thing they announced that I really didn't expect to see uh, was Sandus flashback, which it's not going to be on older, but I, I, I don't have the laptop in. Wait, hold on. I have a laptop in here and they have 128 gigabyte and 256 gigabyte versions of these. And I love these things um, because when I first bought one of these, it was as large as the SSD inside of the laptop and I could just plug it in to the, uh, yeah, I've been running one for about two years, two and a half years now. Um, but yeah, you, there are moments of total undeniable abject terror because the little tiny thing the size of a nickel is somewhere in the hotel yeah. room or you know that's why you kind of you know put it in the usb port and never put it back in fact i'm forcing myself to to put it in the usb port right now which is causing uh someone at the table opposite me to look at me uh with what probably resembles mild terror because they can't see what my hands are doing below the table so i'll just pull this up <laughs> like this wave and they'll turn away and they just did that was really funny um but uh so they they came up with uh sandis flashback uh, it's really simple, right? It's it's uh, automated cloud backup. They're going to do it with the Ultra th USB 3.1 and the Ultra Fit USB 3.1 flash drives. And you have to buy the new ones because they need a particular identifying number encoded onto the drive itself to unlock the service. Um, but it automatically backs up your thumb drive to their cloud storage system constantly. So that's cool you know you label your drives it, it tells you you know you can click on oh you know i left that drive at home well you can access it online i think i lost that drive well you can access it online uh i can't remember which drive has the baby photos on it or the presentation or my homework or the picture of the cat you can search the contents of all of your flashback ready drives that you've backed up online um and it's fairly cheap uh first year is free 
Uh, yeah. After that, it's a buck a year for the 16 gigabyte drive. Max out, I think, 10 bucks a year for the 256 gigabyte drive. Um, you have to make sure there's a little, little sort of sticker in the corner that tells you that it is the appropriate drive that has the, the certification number. But they're out in stores now. I've, I mean, you, you know, this is this is something that is pretty much pointed at you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great way of kind of forcing people to have that cloud backup. Right. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, it's it makes sense for them to be kind of giving you a taste of the online storage because eventually they will charge you for it after the first year, but the prices are low. Like compared yeah. to industry average, it was pretty aggressive pricing. And they're giving you the same amount of storage uh, like as the drive itself. So if you buy a 256 right. gig drive, you get that amount of online storage for free for the first year. And then after that, you pay monthly or yearly for it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, what was going on with uh, uh, <laughs> something we don't generally expect to see very often these days, uh, our new sound cards. What was going on with EVGA? Right. Uh, so when I walked into EVGA and then oh, thought wow. that, Nine. that <laughs> when, when I thought I was at a hi-fi show, this suddenly right. made me very happy because here we have like an engineer from the UK setting up this really nice sound system and what this is. And I was a little surprised because we, we had seen like on Twitter, EVG had teased this new product coming and it kind of looked like the corner of a video card. And instead it's like, it looks like a miniature video card. It even has RGB lighting on it, but it is a sound card. It's called the new audio card. Right. And it's not just a sound card. This is like specifically geared towards audio enthusiasts. And it's, First and foremost, a stereo card. This is not like your typical gaming solution where it's a DSP right. creating simulated like 3D effects and that sort of thing. This is it's similar to the Asus Zonar cards that came yeah. out several years ago, where they had a they sat down and decided to create a PCI Express card that was a badass stereo source. Yes. And um, by the numbers that they had internally, and I, I'd love to 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 have this stuff um, to put together in like a review, but some of their internal testing uh, showed very very impressive signal to noise ratio, channel separation, extremely low uh, intermodulation distortion, and just distortion numbers in general. And you were right. looking at something that looked like if you if you read stereophile reviews, we were seeing this kind of material in the suite and like this is like a legitimate audiophile this looks like a DAC yeah. and it's it's well, it does have in it a has PCI a, express package one of my favorite DACs is actually on that AKM uh, AK4493 I love AKM's DACs there are I have two of them at home uh, both in the JDS Labs products um, you know the the specs look fantastic they 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 did you know you know they, there's there's you know capacitor prawn <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I had to put um, that in our post too, because I'm like, you know, they they took the trouble of doing this, and you know, you don't often see the component quality right in a sound card. Even and the, and the big thing I wanted to point out too is I, I Asus did this before, and it's really good to see another product that actually has dedicated uh, clock chips like oscillators right. for the different actual sampling rates. So you have a 44-1 based and a 48 uh, kilohertz based clock generator. So you're getting legitimate 44-1 16-bit, like every CD ever made right. and almost every MP3 file and music that streams over the internet is 1644. And yet almost every computer in the world has only the 48 kilohertz mm -hmm. clock generator so everything you're hearing gets resampled on the fly and not usually very right. well so it's it's good to see another solution that actually is you're giving you the sound in an unaltered state and they were playing uncompressed music files through kind of a an entry-level hi-fi system like a two thousand dollar integrated amplifier and speakers to match and it sounded fantastic even in a, a hotel suite but I got to demo with headphones as well. It sounds really, really clean. And I, I just personally was geeking out over two-channel audio. Really? Uh, especially from EVGA. I'm thinking this is a gaming company. This is a graphics card company. But 
hey, they're they are audio enthusiasts. I was very pleased to see the founder of the company was was showing off pictures of his home like uh, stereo rig, and That's funny. he he he's all about the two channel audio. So, and the price tag puts this in kind of an interesting position though, because I don't think a lot of people in the mainstream are interested in an audio card period because they are probably content right. with motherboard audio because they've never really heard the difference. And then uh, higher end audio solutions somewhere in the $99 and above range are, you know, they're out of a lot of people's, they're off their radar a little. And this is $249. Right. So it's definitely a high end product and it's an audiophile product. But it's sometimes hard for me, especially because I've been trying to do this for years, convince people to spend more money on good two channel audio. And I, I hope it's successful. It really just <laughs> takes a demo to, it's, to hear it's, a difference. Yeah, it's I mean, it's impressive in a lot of ways, but also it's it's competing against products that sell for, you know, like a, I want to say like JDS Labs, um, their OL DAC sells for 100 bucks. Um, you know, which is, it doesn't have a headphone amplifier built into it, uh, but you can get like the OL DAC and their Atom headphone amplifier for 200 bucks, which are discrete and external, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's always tough to be in a world where you've got something like an AudioQuest Dragonfly, where for a hundred, you know, 130, 150 bucks, you can get some pretty extraordinary sound output. Um, it, and it's also funny cause I, I stepped into audio precision's suite to, find a contact there because of, of having so many questions about how people are interpreting. Because, you know, we don't really do them here because, you know, I don't own a, you know, $20,000 audio analyzer, and I, nor am I very likely to. But it's interesting to see the way certain groups online kind of battle over interpreting the, the stats on that. So I basically track down some of the engineers so I can start asking them questions about how people are interpreting the numbers and what's considered audible or not. It's like... You know, I think the negative 130 dB is kind of well below the audible threshold in an instrument or, a, you know, in a, in, a, in a piece of audio equipment. And why are people getting so upset about that? And uh, there may or may not have been some, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to look at. I'm fascinated that they did this. I'm curious to see what the MSRP is going to, or I should say what the street price is going to be versus yeah, the MSRP. Yeah. Um, and there, there's already early pricing for members of their, they have like an insider program. And that will be offered to those members at, I think, 189 So already looking at the possibility of perhaps a lower price going forward, I would not be surprised at all. And, and one of the interesting things about this, actually, architecturally, I don't know if that's the right word, internally, it's well, actually a USB device. So oh, wow. it's, a US, it's a USB device bridged to a PCIe interface. And I, <laughs> I immediately asked the engineer from AudioNote who was there. Right, uh, and he's like, I said, so will there be a USB version of this? And he kind of was like, yeah, that's kind of in the works. That was the sort of thinking. I'm and no promises on any products or anything, but this is kind of like an introdu introduction to sound from EVGA. It's sort of a an aspirational product, I think, for somebody to get into high end audio. And it's it, one of the ideas behind it is that. Because it is PCIe, you can put this into mm -hmm. a small form factor build and then have something you could take with you that has like studio quality sound capability right. without having to worry about bringing an external solution. So for, for people like us, it's, it's yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but it, it, I don't know. It was, it was also like I, I got a chance to listen to some speakers. Um, there's some new fantastically priced uh First of all, like air motion transformers, which is a peculiar kind of tweeter that looks like the side of an accordion and it's pleated and it goes like yeah. this. And a company called Heil invented them. They were showing up all over the place. Elac, uh, Andrew Jones from Elac, and I won't put everybody to sleep by going, Elac makes great stuff for an amazing price because you've heard me do that a thousand times. I just did it again. Sorry. Um, Andrew Jones designed his first, uh, uh, you know, uh, air motion transformer. Although it's the jet tweeter they have that comes out of a, a, a tradition at Elac and there was another, you know, there's the, there's a new, I want to say the T0 from Emotiva, uh, which sounds unbelievably good for the money you're paying for that from Air Motion Transformers. There was, 
a couple other companies out there. It was interesting to see so many of these show up at CES this year. Um, I, I feel comfortable almost in calling it a trend <laughs> for, for CES. Um, Don't jinx it. So yeah, I, I I won't jinx it. I'm just excited. I'm always excited. You know, we're not going to touch anything in, in headphones or headsets today. We'll maybe do that next week. But um, some interesting things I, there for sure to cover. Yeah. Yeah, and some frustrating things too, especially in gaming headsets. But uh, I'm always bitter about some of the gaming, some of the choices made in gaming headsets. <laughs> um, but uh, some actually some inter- I'll save it for next week. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I always love it when high quality audio stuff shows up because I love music. And also, maybe I'll point out that most gaming is actually designed for stereo reproduction and that maybe using third party tools to create, you know, 3D sound experiences might not work particularly well on many video games. But uh, we, we, we can talk about that next yeah. week. Um, because, again, there's there's just a ton of stuff at CES every year. Um, all right. You know, I forgot that this was the next story on your HyperX Odyssey team up for a new headset. Yeah, see, and speaking of gaming headsets, yeah, but, but this well, is this interesting was... because it's planar magnetic yes. Odyssey 100 millimeter drivers. Yeah, well, it's basically HyperX's version of the Odyssey Mobius uh, headset, yes. which, which I have spent a lot of time with. Um, and I believe so, the retail on that one is about $100 more than this, right? This is $299 yeah. from HyperX. Well, so it's it, at the very yeah, they, high end of like the gaming headset market, but the low end of the planar magnetic like Odyssey market. It's the low end of uh, Odyssey. I like a lot of what Odyssey does. They are not an inexpensive company. Um, no. You know, they make a lot of, you know, they make $3,000 headphones. They make no apologies about it, and quite frankly, for some of their products, I wouldn't apologize either because they're that good. And they're they're up there, at, you know, Odyssey, Mr. Speakers, um, some of the high end versions of the Fostec stuff. Um, Hi-Fi Man would be another one where you know anywhere from you know I mean, planar, the very best planar magnetics um, are probably starting at around three hundred dollars, um, and. Planar Magnetics. Do you want to talk about Planar Magnetics? Because I'm going to pull up a link real quick. But no, <laughs> it's that, a very different way of, of pushing sound into your ear holes. I, the closest parallel that I have here, because I don't have any planar headphones, is I have planar speakers. I have a pair of Magnapan MT12s, which are a few right. years old now. But this is a large... Uh, it's almost like a, a window frame. You have something that's about four feet tall. This one's uh, about a foot and a half wide and an inch thick. The idea behind these is you have a very thin film. And Magnapan is a little bit different because they still have a coil. But essentially, you have something that it, that is suspended between two magnets. And electrical, like positive and negative charges can pull this film, this extremely right. lightweight film backwards and forwards at incredible rates of speed and do things that traditional uh, speaker coils just cannot do where you're, you're you worry right. about rigidity with speaker coils which you know if you're not rigid enough then you have distortion through different parts of the audio spectrum but if you right. are too thick in the name of becoming more rigid then you you lose out on the ability to move the speaker efficiently enough to reproduce the sound at higher frequencies. So it's it's really a fantastic alternative. The problem yes. is that historically it's been so expensive to implement yes. and it was unheard of in in mainstream headphones and there are even planar magnetic earbuds now from Odyssey, but right. that's sort of subject do- for another day. Yeah, I mean, Odyssey, they've, they've done more to push planar magnetic technology into different places than any other company out there in terms of, of, of the eye sign, which is a very small or the sign, which is a very small over ear or so on ear uh, planar magnetic headphone, um, the eye signs, which are the in-ears, the earbuds you were talking about. Um, yeah. But they, you know, when you look at when you when you look at planar magnetic technology, the only stuff under two hundred dollars used to be uh, Fostex T fifty RPs, which sound extraordinary, but they kind of disappear below sixty hertz, which sucks if you're dealing with explosions or you like have full round uh, bass drum uh, setting. You know they they do an extraordinary job rendering, 
he's you know Sebastian was explaining when you when you have you know when you take something it's like a sophisticated version of saran wrap uh, and run electricity through it while suspending it between two stators you can accelerate and decelerate it incredibly fast which gives you extraordinary resolution or, or the detail you know symbols sound best when the decay or the 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 you know backside of the the sound is rendered more accurately and being able to precisely control that that driver uh, is really amazing but you know right now you can get hi-fi man's he uh, 400 eyes for about 180 bucks monoliths early planar magnetics were i will affectionately say kind of atrocious but you can get their closed back the m565c uh, which sounds pretty amazing and in fact a, a friend of mine over at the wire cutter uh Laura Dragon uh, picked that as the kind of the best everyday audiophile headphones. Um, they sell for 230 bucks right now. Uh, they do not have a, a mic, so they may not be appropriate if, if you need to get your Discord on, or you would have to use a separate mic, but the audio experience is kind of really extraordinary. And by the way, feel free to you know buy things through the wire cutter because clicking on those Amazon links uh, is how they get paid. Um, but the... There was a lot of stuff going on that I haven't had a chance to go up to HyperX's uh, suite yet. You know, I loved the drivers in the Odyssey Mobius. Um, they felt comfortable. You know, it's an incredibly flexible, you know, plastic. Okay, we're going to deal with gamers flinging stuff, you know, across the room and it's not going to break. Um, my frustration was with, and I believe, the, the, I don't believe, I know for a fact, they they either have released or are working on a firmware upgrade because the microphone uh, configuration made it uh, the microphone configuration made it uh, it was kind of cutting off uh, communications making it more difficult um, which I believe is something you can fix in firmware but I will be flat out I don't particularly enjoy the Waves NX um, uh, audio environments above and beyond say, you know, consuming content where it creates sort of a 5.1 surround. I don't particularly like the artificial kind of impacts they bring to game or the artificial rooming or the artificial, you know, uh, room simulation or environment simulation they bring to games. Some people have found that it actually creates issues with how it reinterprets the soundtrack for the games because the games were designed to come from two speakers or two speakers or 5.1 speakers. And in some cases, it was kind of, I think a friend of mine said the way he explained it was like, he thought somebody was stalking him, you know, right next to him. Like somebody was about to stab him in the video game, you know, and he kind of stood up and turned to defend himself. And, the, and in the video game environment, they were, you know, hundreds of yards away and then sniped him. And, you know, I loved the sound of, of the Mobius and... You know, the Bluetooth was was really, really effective. Conversing on the microphone was problematic, but again, that seems to be a firmware repair. But I would have so much preferred that it was a straight stereo headset rather than including all the Waves NX technology. Because the other thing is, as a content creator, the head tracking stuff that costs more in the HyperX headset is great if you are, you know, if you are creating an object-oriented sound environment and you want to simulate that, it's great. But head tracking... I don't particularly need to leave my audio here and hear it in my left ear when I'm playing most video games because I'm never leaving my face from the video game because I'm playing a video game and I don't want to get shot or stabbed or run off the track or, you know, not catch a pass or whatever. You know what I mean? You don't. And for VR headsets, the VR headset does all of the tracking. So you don't need a secondary device tracking the motion because your headset's already doing that. Um, so I was very curious to see this partnership between HyperX and Mobius and the fact that I was kind of like, oh, it's, you know, the other thing we should probably point out is the most sophisticated stuff using the 3D, uh, the, the Waves NX uh, technology requires you to be plugged into the computer via a USB cable. Um, That's true. One thing I should have clarified in the news post is that there are two versions, one with and one right. without that head tracking. So yeah, but the you difference is only like thirty dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which you know, I just I don't think anybody really needs the head. I love that they did a version without the head tracking because I think the head tracking is useless unless you're a content creator. Um, I. You know, I kept turning off all the Waves NX stuff. And, you know, maybe that's because I'm just 
old school and, and, and think things should be done that way, but some pretty serious gamers out there found it a little frustrating. Um, I also, you know, like this without Waves NX technology, an onboard amp and a true wireless. I, I just, yeah, there's so many good things going on with the driver uh, that I was kind of, I was, I was kind of surprised actually to see uh, to see this come out from HyperX because HyperX does some very affordable, extremely good gaming headsets for the money. Yeah, already their driver tech, and I have one of the newest sets mm -hmm. here that I need to get the review on the the, the mix. Those mm -hmm. sound great. Those are good for yeah. just walking around listening to audio. And if you have a, a mobile device that supports AppDex, and I've been using a Samsung Galaxy phone for a little while now, it is so much better to go with like an AppDex connection over standard Bluetooth like SPC or even AAC codec. It's noticeable. Mm -hmm. and, and I have the developer options enabled so I can actually flip between them on the fly. And you, you just hear the sound completely open up and sound almost like it's plugged in. So it... Already, I consider them like a higher end headphone option that I have to grab around the house. If I don't want to worry about wires, and they have a, at the price point that they go for, it was already pretty compelling even for music listening beyond just its gaming capabilities. So I was curious to see them come out with a much higher end option as far as like very high end price point. I, I think Sennheiser has a gaming headset in the $300 range. Mm -hmm. And so they're joining them with like that really um, high end option, but it's, I will be interested to see what the actual like traction is for planar magnetic in gaming headphones. Not that I'm complaining. I mean, I think it's great right. to introduce it and get people to listen to it. And it absolutely does have like really like solid bass response on top of everything else mm -hmm. we talked about that planar can do. It so. is an excellent sounding headphone. It's just, you know, three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars. I, I I would have loved to have seen the extraordinary sound from this stereo headphone to be unencumbered by the expensive, you know, uh, or or maybe it's it's just you know the 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 margins that Odyssey gets. Um, I, I think a, a three you know a, a a less expensive version of this without the waves and x stuff would be utterly fantastic cuz one of the things i'm i'm kind of curious about for hyperx is you know does it retain the setting changes you make does it reset itself every time you restart it um, there there were some some minor details and there are, i will say there are a lot of controls uh, on the mobius version and i haven't gotten again i haven't gotten eyeballs on this one um, but the you know there's a there was a separate uh, microphone level wheel and volume level wheel and both of those are clickable to change and change settings and there's just a lot going on in this you know there's a switch here there's a button here there's a button here um you know it there's a, a little bit of a learning curve to figure out how to handle all of the controls on this and uh it's it's fun to nerd out with and i will say that there are a lot of people out there that think the uh the 360 degree audio environment from Waves NX is absolutely fantastic. So if you get a chance to experience it, you certainly should and, you know, see how you feel feel about it. Um, I think we were both extremely excited about one of Dell's announcements. Uh, and again, oh, yes. I, my CES coverage is sponsored by Dell. Don't get angry, but this is really cool. I'll let Sebastian talk about it. <laughs> okay, so imagine if you took a desktop computer and crammed it into a laptop. The the Dell, what is it, the Area 51M. Mm -hmm. And The Verge was, I think, the one who got the really nice, like, hands-on, inside uh, look at it. And they have, of course, beautiful photos and video on their site covering this. But this is not just a striking-looking design, but when you actually get into it, like take the bottom cover off, there is a full-size desktop CPU in there that's just in a regular socket, and you can pull it out and put in different desktop CPUs. And while it doesn't use a desktop graphics card, it does use a modular graphics card. So however prohibitively expensive future upgrades may be, they will be possible. I know that that was the promise of MXM all along, but it does at least for the CPU and memory being just right there and desktop class CPU alone would be a draw for 
a serious like desktop replacement gaming solution. But it's just a fascinating concept to me that you're putting. Let's see what is in here: ninety seven hundred to ninety nine hundred K Intel CPUs in here. So mm-hmm. a Core i nine with uh, RTX twenty eighty in a laptop, which. Uh, I'm. Sh- I don't know if they're even talking battery life at this point. I'm sure it's just going to be plugged right. in. It reminds me of the days of the luggable computer form factor, mm-hmm. where you know, preceding laptops when you would essentially just put a handle on a desktop tower. Like a, a small form factor in that era was, of course, about 40 pounds, and you had to have it directly plugged into use, or maybe there'd be some giant battery pack attached to it somewhere. But this is a just awesome to me in the I, I love the idea of like the the bigger, thicker, much more powerful idea of that ultimate gaming laptop, which they're calling the world's fastest gaming laptop. I which I don't doubt, even if it's just CPU performance. And judging by the the pictures of the massive heat pipes, uh, I'm sure that it's probably pretty adequately cooled as well. Yeah. I yeah I I I I was laughing because of course somebody in the Dell booth pulled up um, Solitaire on it. Um, oh my gosh! Apparently it's kind of a, <laughs> well, it, people people have their humors, um, but uh, you know Solitaire I, 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 at five hundred frames a second. <laughs> I think they said more like three thousand frames a second. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, five hundred vastly higher frames per second than the monitor can actually render, but. Uh, it was, you know, it's 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 big. It's a 17-inch laptop, right? So it's a lunch tray. But that level, I mean, just I I like you. I you know, they flipped that thing over, and I desperately wanted to flip it over and start undoing screws, but I didn't feel like being beaten to death by any of number of very nice engineers and marketing people that were in the Dell booth, um, because I wanted to see how, you know how the card was secured in place. Um, the fact that it's got an upgradable or the option of upgrading the CPU is mind blowing because we saw stuff doing this, you know, back in the '90s where they would put a desktop, uh, kind of kind of a chipset. Uh, they would kind of kludge, I think is the word I would use. They would kludge a desktop motherboard inside of a PC, but they were atrocious. The battery life was measured in milliseconds. They they yeah. ran hot. They ran loud. And you know this. This is a well thought out way to put a staggering amount of computing power in a very relatively small package uh, with a nice monitor attached to it. And, you know, I see this showing up. I can think of, you know, video, edit- video editors who would like this, people that are doing, you know, engineering applications, geoscience. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who use computers in strange places under difficult conditions that would really enjoy having a massive increase in power. Uh, over what they can get in a in a laptop, and I think it's it's crazy and ridiculous, and I think it's pretty cool. But you know, again, I'm a nerd, and I you know deal with rendering video uh, on laptops and and editing and stuff like that. So it's pretty compelling. Again, I've been sponsored by Dell at CES 2019. Don't get angry, but this thing's you know I like moonshots. I like ridiculous, over the top products uh, that make me happy. We haven't even gotten to LG's roll up TV which yeah. is a 65 inch OLED that scrolls up and then retreats down into its sound bar. And it's a big sound bar. It's like 12 inches by 12 inches by, by four feet, give or take. But, you know, it's mesmerizing to watch that screen roll up because it is just as absolutely gorgeous as any OLED that LG has ever made. You know, we haven't seen the measurements yet, but it is, you know, I don't I don't get giddy over stuff, but that I was pretty giddy watching that monitor. I sat there and, you know, watched multiple monitors. They have a, a display where they're going up and down and it's it's kind of like watching the fountain at the Bellagio. Um, but it's, you know, there's some pretty cool stuff at CES this year. I, you I wonder know, what the MTBF product? is on the. I wonder what the MTBF is on the, like the up and down motor mechanism for that OLED TV. Like how many thousands I, times can I demo that before I kill it? Really? Okay. Yes, that that is the number that 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 they were talking about. I, I think, I hope LG uh, 
<laughs> did a good job on that because 20,000 is a staggeringly long time. I mean, you need an angry four year old with a lot of free time to, to get through 20,000 cycles on that uh, in any non decade kind of length uh, cycling period. But it's a pretty, I don't know, it was cool to watch and they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, any last products you want to mention? Anything that you saw on the show floor that just absolutely grabbed you? No, I mean, I I was mostly in, entirely in meetings, actually, and I was there for a brief time. I mean, my favorite things were probably like EVGA. We already talked about that. Just like cool audio stuff always gets me. It, it kills me that I can't go to the, the show floor uh, and look at just TVs. I would I would probably spend an extra day just geeking out over display technology if I could. I think my favorite thing was probably that thousand zone monitor and you owe yeah. it to yourself to go look at it if you have the chance but i will try to hunt it down and find it because that's that's pretty crazy ladies and gentlemen if you are curious to see uh, nvidia's gtx 2600 benchmarks you should head over to pcper.com which oddly enough is the home of mr sebastian peak and his benchmarking efforts it is a fantastic place to read reviews and you should be dancing over there right now because he is probably going to run to another part of his house and hit buttons and make cards go actually i the the testing rack is behind you on the screen I that's true that. right he's, here he's going to so turn his chair video, around yeah, i'll just i'll just turn around and get right back to benchmarking like i was doing all the way up until i got on a plane to go to ces and because the story <laughs> isn't done like you can read my right. my initial review of the rtx 2060 now at pcper.com but uh, there's you more should. testing to do like they, I didn't have a chance to even get to the 1440 numbers. I did full HD and UHD. So I need to fill in the middle there, get the 1440 stuff done. There's going to be a follow-up article. So there's plenty of stuff coming as well that we yeah. can't necessarily talk about. But exciting stuff in the works. Even though CES is almost over, there will be a lot to to read in the coming weeks. Oh, um, if you don't know about it, Shannon Morris and I host a show called Tech Thing, and you can head over there and see lots of things that were not inside of meeting rooms at CES uh, 2019. Go up to youtube.com slash tech thing. we got a ton of videos posted up there you can look at, including uh, later on today or early tomorrow morning, we'll have Robert Heron talking about the best TVs and the new TV technology that came out at CES 2019. Shannon and I are in a few minutes or a few hours. Sometime. Time loses uh, something in Las Vegas, yes. especially at CES. But we will be uh, recording a whole bunch of our favorite picks at the show. Uh, we've got a bunch of high-resolution videos so you can see what's going on with some of the products we were talking about in the show today. Uh, and man, oh, you should point out, if you're looking for a new laptop, keep an eye out on youtube.com slash tech thing because I think, how many laptops? Shannon just walked up. How many laptops were in your video of laptops from CES? I think I had like seven, six seven. or seven. Yeah, there's, and that was just what I saw. There are a lot of laptops here. Um, and if you like laptops and you're thinking about upgrading, you should definitely check out that video, youtube.com slash tech thing. And I am going to, well, run and start uploading and downloading video again because it's that time of day, people, to get the production on. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching This Week in Computer Hardware. We call it Twitch. You can find older episodes up at twit.tv slash twitch, including all the information on how to subscribe. As I mentioned before, Sebastian Pete can be found at PC Per. You can find me at tekthing.com or abxl.com. And we hope you have enjoyed this episode of the show, and we hope you will keep watching it in the future. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. <laughs>